today. I appreciate that very much. Some years ago, a number of parliamentarians in your country agreed to establish Mavrovo National Park. You may wonder why I mentioned that park as we begin talking about NATO and North Macedonia. It's for this reason. NATO and Mavrovo National Park were each founded in 1949. Not geographically, of course, not culturally, but by the design of the lawmakers, the parliamentarians, who at that time each built something that they saw useful to the future. In your country, the parliamentarians then in the assembly, as I remember, crafted the establishment of that national park. And in 12 countries in 1949, the parliamentarians and the national leaderships banded together to create the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Each of them in your country and in those 12 saw the utility of building these organizations for the future. And indeed, here with North Macedonia as the newest member of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, we have seen that come to fruition. Now, why do I mention the park? It's a metaphor, of course, because of what those individuals did in looking toward what we have today. They were building for the future. I won't go long on the history of, of Macedonia, but it has been a 27 year work to bring Macedonia into the Alliance as its newest member. So let's get started. I call this NATO and you, North Macedonia as a NATO ally. I'm really speaking about you. And I very much appreciate your listening to me in my Native American English, which I'm sure is only one of the languages that you speak routinely. This slide, of course, we could spend the next day on if we so chose. What defines you? And I begin with this because to see yourself and how you relate to not only your own countrymen, but to the other members of the Alliance and the other citizens of the world democracies and other organizations and structures is how you will best engage in your future. I ask if you're defined by your gender, your age, your culture, and so forth. Of course we are. But let me suggest to you that regardless of how we see ourselves through whatever those lenses, those do not define your destiny. You control that. Um, there are many others who see you and I through their own lenses, of course, as they will. But as Anaya Nin put it, we do not see things as they are we see things as we are. And helping to look through and learn from the lenses of others will help each of us, and it certainly has me, in the manner in which I work with other countries, other, other citizens, and understand international organizations such as NATO. By the way, I'd like to engage in this discussion this evening, very much as if we were sitting in the same room. So if you have things to share, if you have comments or questions, uh, waggle a hand, I suspect, at, at Eric or whoever can unmute you, and uh, we'll engage in this as if we were sitting in the same room. I chose this photo, it's from a NATO website. It shows three people in military uniform under the hashtag we are NATO. But it's really very much more than the military or the civilians. It's all of us together. Yes, indeed, collectively, we are NATO. From a capital among any of the 30 
members of this alliance, of course, those po political leaders that we have elected are managing uh, many, many relationships within NATO with 29 other countries, many of whom are in the European Union, 27 of them, not all of whom, by the way, are in NATO. And then, of course, your international leaders and your national leadership are dealing with 192 other countries in the world of the United Nations. That's why I chose this, this unusual chessboard of the globe, if you will. Think of all the relationships that your diplomats and your political leaders are looking to manage. And you and I, but more particularly you, will become adept if you so choose at dealing in those relationships. And I urge you to become engaged in that kind of involvement. I chose this chessboard because you may have heard in English or other languages the term level playing field. I don't like that term because as you can well understand in international affairs, there is no such thing as a level playing field. Each nation on that wobbly chessboard that I have here or that Go board that I show you as well, each nation is looking to better its own positions in the manner in which it interacts with other nations of the world. So is the playing field level? Not from any of those 193 different positions. This is a slide showing you the new NATO headquarters. Well, it was new as of uh, the last few years, but nonetheless, it's not the old NATO headquarters that existed in 1949 uh, until this one was built. Interestingly, the, uh, the previous NATO headquarters is literally across the street from what you see here. Now, I don't know whether any of you enjoy Italian biscotti with your coffee, but to me, the uh, architects here looks like they have created a series of biscotti all stacked one behind the other. I urge you to visit this headquarters. It's architecturally fascinating. It's a beautiful series of buildings linked together. And in the very front of it, you see the flags of the various nations of NATO flying. This is an old photograph, by the way. It doesn't show the Republic of North Macedonian flag. Uh, but I call your attention to the sculpture that you see reflected in the front window of the Alliance. It's a piece of iron sculpture. It points in all directions, tout as they moot, as they would say in, uh, in French. And it's emblematic of what you see on the NATO flag. It's a compass rose pointing in all directions as do the nations of the Alliance. We are all located in different segments of the globe. When the parliamentarians, when the leadership, when the ambassadors of the various nations sit together in their national fora, in the international workplace of NATO, they sit together by alphabetical order in English. So you see where Macedonia is represented around the table. You see the other nations represented. And the ambassadors and their staffs sit in this order each time they come together. You automatically know who your seatmates to your left and to your right are going to be. I have three other items on this slide that I call your attention to. First, decisions by consensus. Now that's an interesting way of doing business. There are 30 nations in this alliance. And consensus means not that every single one of them will say yes to whatever is proposed, but that none of them will say no. The ambassadors to the from the nations sitting around this table or their staffs 
They are called permanent representatives, the ambassadors themselves, or perm reps, as they're called within the building. And they represent each element of their national governments. They speak for your nation when they depress their microphone buttons around these tables and they speak up with the positions of Macedonia or Albania or the United States or any of the others that you see gathered around the table. It's very powerful when they depress that microphone button because they're speaking for a sovereign nation. And each of these sovereign nations has complete political control of the militaries in their countries. And I've included that piece on this slide because for many years, a number of the members of NATO did not have that particular ability to say that their political leadership led and controlled their military leadership but that is not the case among the membership of NATO. This slide calls your attention to the treaty itself, and it doesn't take long to read the articles of the North Atlantic Treaty. There aren't very many. You can read the whole thing and start considering it in about 10 minutes, and I would urge you to do that if you've not seen it recently. There are two articles that I'll call your attention to in the following slides. But uh, again, let me reiterate that each of the nations in this alliance are sovereign. The Republic of North Macedonia is not providing any control over its government or its people to an international non-governmental organization like NATO. And those who wrote the charter, the treaty in 1949, left it open to the future. They left it open to enlargement. And in fact, the alliance has enlarged eight times since 1949. In fact, since I suspect many of you were born, it has enlarged four times just since the year 2004 with, of course, the Republic of North Macedonia being the most recent addition in 2020. Now, I mention here the media and consultation, and I'll call your attention to those in particular uh, on these next slides. Article 4 of the North Atlantic Treaty is called the Consultation Article. And I'll stop talking for a moment and let you read this. What I consider the key piece to this slide is that it allows any of the 30 members of the Alliance to bring up whatever issue they so choose if they feel it of concern. That's not only those things internally that may be of concern, but something that might be happening in one of the other 29 nations of the Alliance or in any other nation that might threaten the independence or the sovereignty of one of the 30. For example, in February, the ambassadors of the nations met in the North Atlantic Council, sitting in that alphabetical order, as on the slide I just showed you, because Turkey raised an issue concerning how NATO might be working to support Turkey with regards to the situation in Syria. An, an example, if you will, of Article 4 which allows the ambassadors to convene the North Atlantic Council whenever they so wish to discuss whatever is on their mind, the consultation article. Article five, which I'll call your attention to on this slide, is what I call the most misquoted article of the entire treaty. And it's more normally misquoted by the media because they don't show it, it's an in, 
in its entirety, as you see here in the first paragraph. So again, I'll stop talking and allow you a moment to read through this. The underlining and the highlighting is mine. When I say it's misquoted by the media, it's simply because the media normally puts a full stop or a period at the end of shall be considered an attack against them all. But as you read this, you understand that each of the nations may take whatever such action they deem necessary to assist the party that considers themselves or has been attacked, including the use of armed force, but not only the use of armed force. In other words, it's up to each of the nations as to how they will respond under Article 5. At some point, you may wish to reread this again. I remember working in a large conference room in Warsaw, Poland, before Poland joined the alliance. And I had this same slide on the screen. And we were talking about it and what it meant. And one of the senior officials in the room said, Larry, we thought when Poland joins the alliance, we will automatically come under the nuclear umbrella of the United States. And I said, thank you very much, sir, for sharing what you thought, but what does it say in this article? What it says is that our nations, yours, mine, and the others, will take such action as we deem necessary. This slide shows you the result of a recent uh, analysis of data that was presented in the nations that you see here. On the left side of the screen, it was the publics in NATO nations that express reluctance on Article 5 obligations. The percent who say that if Russia got into a serious military conflict with one of its neighboring countries that is our NATO ally, and then these countries responded whether their country should use military force to defend the other countries so involved. The shoulds are on the right-hand side, the should-nots are in blue on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side of the screen, it reads those, or the percentage of nations within nations who say, if Russia got into a serious conflict with one of its neighboring countries that is a NATO ally, the United States would or would not use military force. You might like to study this as you uh, perhaps look at this slide in future. You can find it under the Pew Research Center uh, under its February 9th data. And the data is quite interesting when you, when you consider what nations believe of their own country and then what nation citizens believe the United States would do. And these, of course, are simply opinions. This slide shows you a bit of who's who in the alliance. The Secretary General, of course, as you know, is Jens Stoltenberg. He presides over that North Atlantic Council, and of course, by leadership over all the other international uh, sessions and committees that, that comprise the NATO organization. NATO, of course, is a civil organization. It has a very strong military component, of course, 
But please understand, it's a civil organization, not a military organization. One of the committees within NATO is the military committee. That is presided over by Air Chief Marshal Sir Stuart Peach of the Royal Air Force, a Brit. He is chairman of the military committee. He's, if you will, an inside consultant. He presides, as does the military committee, over the international military staff. These are men and women wearing uniform who do the work of the military committee within NATO. The civilians of NATO, of course, are hired by NATO itself. They are representing and working for NATO, not their individual nations, from whichever nation they come. And some nations also second their own individuals to work within NATO. So within the international uh, staff, you will see men and women who are not only paid, employed by NATO, doing the work of NATO, but you might also find those who are paid by their national governments, but they're similarly doing the work, not for their na nation, but for NATO itself. At the lower portion of this screen, you see the NATO military strategic commanders. On the left, General Andre Lanata. He is called Supreme Allied Commander Transforma Transformation. His headquarters is in Norfolk, Virginia, in the United States. And I'm speaking to you from Virginia, by the way. It's on the eastern seaboard of the United States. It's a very rainy day today, and it's about 16 degrees centigrade. General Lanata is. Uh, French Air Force. At the military headquarters that commands all military operations within NATO is the head General Todd Walters. United States Air Force is his background. And he wears two hats. He wears a hat as Supreme Allied Commander Europe. That is the, that is the historical title that has stayed with his position. Ever since the first SACUR, a general named Dwight Eisenhower uh, became the first SACUR. His actual title is Supreme Allied Commander Operations, SACO. He also wears a national hat, a U.S. hat, which occupies very little of his, uh, his time as Commander U.S. European Command. But he keeps his headquarters and his residence in Belgium. Um, his headquarters is located just outside of the city of Mons, Belgium, about an hour south of Brussels. Let's look at the budget that NATO has available to it. There's a civil budget, again, to do the work of the civilian employees and the infrastructure surrounding the various committees and the activities of the civil structure of NATO, that amounts to about 256 million euros annually. There's a larger military budget because this is uh, added to by the nations themselves and their military contributions of about 1.5 billion euros. And I'll stop talking and let you read this quotation from General Stolten, uh, excuse me, Secretary General Stoltenberg. You can only imagine that among 30 nations, the manner in which they contribute to NATO uh, is very much a national consideration. And I'd like you to think of NATO as a contributory organization. It is what nations choose to contribute to NATO, which is what NATO itself works with on both the civil side and the military side. Again, every nation is sovereign in the alliance.
the manner in which decisions are made in NATO. And typically the phrase in European languages is NATO takes decisions. In the United States, I would traditionally say the way NATO makes decisions. But nonetheless, it's the same. Consensus is the order of the way in which NATO works. Again, 30 nations, none of whom saying no to what is uh, agreed. Once consensus is formed, once NATO agrees to whatever the issue, it's a very strong consideration. That's consensus. NATO also uses a very interesting process that I suspect you have used in your own families called the silence procedure, where something is proposed and it is put out and sent to each of the nations, their staff in, in uh, Brussels, their national staffs in capitals, of course, and it would simply say something uh, akin to this. Here is what we propose. If we have not heard from your capital by close of business on the 5th of May, it will be understood that we have reached agreement. It's a very neat way of doing business. If the nations have no objections to what is proposed, all they need to do is say nothing. Conversely, if there's a national consideration, you will hear the phrase used that the Republic of Mas North Macedonia or the United States or Norway or any of the other NATO nations breaks silence. And what that means is that the concern will be continued to be discussed until consensus is reached. Once consensus is reached, then what uh, transpires would be agreed by each of the nations. I suspect many of you are authors, or you will be authors in your college or university papers, in your own writings, and perhaps you use footnotes in your writing. I urge you to pay particular attention to every single footnote you see in a NATO document. Why? because nations will put their national concerns into the footnotes. They may agree, they may provide their consensus to a NATO document, but if there's a footnote, they may call everyone else's attention to a national position that they put into a footnote. So please read the footnotes. I call them political improvised explosive devices. If you don't pay attention to them, they can be very challenging to you if you haven't learned what it is that that nation is saying. The last item here, inquisitiveness. This is an interesting way of diplomatic behavior around the conference table, around the tables of committees or the North Atlantic Council. Think of it this way. If the ambassadors sit about and they are discussing whatever the issue is and one or more nations has a particular concern, they may wish to withhold their consensus, but rather than saying no, they may simply say, my government has a series of questions that we would like answered in the fullness of time. And then their staff would present to the NATO staff and to everyone else around the table a series of questions, perhaps. Now, those questions may take months to answer. It will derail the concern of getting consensus on that particular issue. But the nation who has raised the question hasn't said no they have simply brought up other questions that they would like answers to. It's an interesting way of doing business. I've seen it around the table uh, myself as an observer at various NATO meetings. 
This slide shows you the three C's, if you will. C meaning the letter for cooperative security, collective defense, and crisis management. And those were the three main areas from the 2010 strategic concept, the core tasks, if you will, that were accepted at the Lisbon summit. There hasn't been a strategic concept rewritten since 2010. I would expect there will be in the future. When, I can't tell you. But I would expect that uh, given the concerns that we see with this virus today, with the concerns on the various economies of NATO, the economic positions that each of us will be wrestling with, in our own national deliberations, that there will be a new strategic concept coming. Here are the headquarters themselves that I mentioned belong to General Lanata and General Walters. On the left, the emblem of Allied Command Transformation, again in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, again, this is an old photo I used with the flags flying in front of the building. The Republic of North Macedonian flag is not in this slide. I'm sure it is uh, in a recent photo. Similarly, uh, at SHAPE headquarters, Allied Command Operations headquarters outside of Mons, Belgium. This is the website URL for Allied Command transformation and just a few of the many, many activities that they have subordinate within that headquarters. Allied Command Transformation is the studies and analysis organization for the military aspects of NATO and wider. It's the educational considerations for uh, NATO and the military structures within it. And I urge you to visit that website and look around at all the various things in which you might become engaged within NATO. This slide shows you the agreed military operations in which NATO is engaged today. And I chose some recent slides showing the uh, assistance that NATO is providing in uh, at least a number of these military activities. In Kosovo Force, which has been in existence for some years now, you see the, uh, the military official there wearing his mask. Uh, similarly, in Resolute Support in Afghanistan, you see various uh, uh, assistance being provided to the Afghan nation. Sea Guardian is one of the uh, maritime concerns for the Alliance. And in fact, this afternoon, as we're speaking, there's a maritime uh, operational conference taking place uh, similarly via Zoom, which you can uh, take advantage of. Air policing speaks to the manner in which a number of NATO nations provide air coverage uh, NATO fighter aircraft coverage uh, over various airspace that is not their own. In other words, it's community support in the airspace of the NATO nations. And you can look up each one of these on the uh, NATO website dealing with Allied Command operations. NATO is also engaged with European Union forces in Operation Althea. And here, Turkey, for example, and Hungary are NATO nations that become engaged with EU forces, um, along with Bosnia uh, and Herzegovina and Austria in working together. In Iceland, which interestingly has no military forces, we have a variety of NATO nations that provide uh, air support as well staging from Iceland, uh, stationed on a rotational basis in Iceland uh, to provide uh, air coverage uh, for 
the Iceland uh, population. There are a number of current challenges. You can expect uh, what they would be. In addition, of course, the, the most massive current challenge all of us are facing today, and that's the COVID-19 virus. Here are some others, and I show the house on fire, if you will, because at various times, each of these uh, will take uh, precedence in the manner in which your national governments and our governments working together are dealing. Sexism, racism, authoritarianism. Is there divide among Europeans? Certainly. Is there a concern in an interesting term that's called Westlessness. It's a play on the English word restlessness or discomfort, perhaps. And westlessness refers to the challenges to the manner in which the West, the political West, if you will, uh, is dealing with its issues in the world. There is divide here in North America between North Americans and Europeans, between the manner in which Canadians and US citizens are dealing with Europeans and vice versa. And then of course, in my own country, there is certainly divide among us in the United States, politically. Islamophobia is a concern in many of the nations, as is anti-Semitism. Those resurge in various times and in various countries. But each of these, uh, one or more of them, uh, is, a, is a challenge in our nations today. The issues can be these. I'll stop talking and let you read them. And again, these are my considerations, my thoughts. I look forward to hearing yours on how you see things through the lens of a citizen of North Macedonia. There was a study recently done uh, within the Belfer Center at Harvard University by a number of very experienced uh, former NATO ambassadors and others they broke the challenges of NATO into two baskets, actually three, which I'll show you. Challenges within NATO's borders, and you see these four areas. Challenges from beyond NATO's borders. And I'll call your attention to the first one under challenges within NATO's borders. This is a difficult time within the United States and within NATO in the manner in which American presidential leadership has been, by many uh, opinion makers, absent from its leadership within the alliance or its co-leadership within the alliance. The same study looked at the horizon competing with China, winning the technology battles, of course, as we see technology becoming even more prevalent as we're using Zoom and uh, this ability technologically to work with each other around the globe now uh, as we combat the COVID-19 virus. So I would ask you to be prepared. Your preparation, not only for today and tomorrow, but as you look to becoming more involved in your nation's concerns, answer these questions. What are your interests? What are your country's interests? How are these related? How do you understand them through your media? And then, of course, what structures and policies exist 
to advance those interests? What do you want to accomplish with the other members of the Alliance? So I leave you with these three questions. What are your responsibilities? How do you see being a citizen of your Republic? What does success look like to you? And then of course, diplomatically speaking, what is the art of the possible? What can be achieved given what you wish? I've listed a number of things here that I've learned from over the years. Each of these has been a difficult lesson, but nonetheless, I call them to your attention. And I've highlighted, well, I could highlight every single one of them. Rhetoric doesn't equal resources. Talk is not money. And for my countrymen, strategic listening. Listening is as vital as speaking. For those of you who are accustomed to working with other countries of the world, as you are there, I'm certain, we must listen for what is not only said, but what is not said as well. And similarly, when you read a NATO document, with your knowledge of your country and the others, read for what is not present, as well as for what is present. Plato put it this way. And a former US president, Abraham Lincoln, put it this way. I began by with a slide that said NATO and you. Ladies and gentlemen, NATO is us, all of us together. Now, I don't know any of you. We've not yet become friends or colleagues. Regardless of that, I have a challenge for you. I challenge you to earn the trust of your countrymen, to lead to stimulate your nation, to become even more than what you experience today. Use everything you've learned and will learn to help you, and then spend your intellect and your energies to seek out even more tools of which you may today be unaware. Become the professor, the attorney, the diplomat, the parliamentarian, the political leader, whatever it is you wish that your successor generations can remember with thanks. With thanks as we thank those who began this alliance and as those who began Mavrovo National Park. NATO is us. I wish you a very happy May Day and weekend, and that you and your families and all your loved ones remain strong, safe, and healthy. And with that, I welcome your comments, your questions. I look forward to hearing from you. I have a question. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Stefan Kolovsky. I'm a student at the Law Faculty of Skopje studying international relations, uh, European integration and diplomacy. Uh, my question is about civil society's approach towards NATO, since North Macedonian society's education about NATO and transnational security after accession is overlooked by the state actors, which leads uh, to people making ill-informed assumptions based on misinformation. How should the youth as an agency of change inform and manage social relations so as to enhance democratic institutions and promote the idea of collective security? Stefan, thank you. Uh, and I appreciate the energy that you put into that uh, comment and question. 
I think we each know the answer to this. And you have demonstrated, demonstrated it by your studies that you've undertaken there in the law uh, arena. It requires activism. It requires a constant drumbeat, if you will. And that can start with you and your peers, certainly within your university. It can continue within your families and the family discussions that we have of what NATO could become for the Republic of North Macedonia. It's truly where you and your fellow citizens wish to take it. The media can be very powerful, and your generation has available to it, as do your elders, media that the originators of the North Atlantic Treaty did not have. You have electronic means to disseminate information in minutes, in seconds, literally, across countries, across borders, whether that be visually, whether that be digitally in any other form, it's available. You have bloggers, and I, I've been trying in the last few days to study what is out there uh, within, unfortunately for me, only reading the English translations of your news and your media, but it's activism. And what I most enjoy, I think, of your generation is seeing that you are unbridled, you are not hampered by uh, the things which my generation uh, have been saddled with. You're much more prone to get things out into the, the, uh, uh, the thinking space, if you will, digitally. And that is something that I think all of our politicians pay attention to. Certainly in our government, a, uh, even a, uh, a tweet can have great power if it's repeated numerous and retweeted numerous up to the thousands or more times. And you can control some of this. Thank you for your reply and thank you for the lecture. So um, very, very Eric, welcome. Can I ask a question, please? Yes. Hold on one second. Let okay. me, uh, I'll call again in just a second. So Larry, I uh, have two here, one, one that was texted to me. Um, we've seen uh, in, North, in North Macedonia, uh, we had to wait for a long time to become a, mem a member. Uh, and we've seen firsthand how some countries have used the silence procedure and the, uh, the fact that one country could block, um, uh, can block access. Can you explain a little bit what the membership process is? How do countries become members? Ah, thank you, Eric. We could probably uh, spend the rest of the uh, week discussing that one. I'll try to keep it very succinct. As I see it, a challenge of any nation becoming a member is conducting the nation-to-nation -nation discussions across each of the, with, with the, the nation seeking membership and each of the other NATO, and each of the NATO states politically as, as to, I would call it a horse trade of a sort. What's in it for me if we facilitate your joining the alliance? and what's in it, of course, for the nation that wishes to join the alliance, and how can those things be sorted out? Now, I'm not a diplomat. My background is that of an Air Force officer and as a teacher. Um, I have certainly studied and, and uh, been on the margins in watching and researching and learning of NATO uh, throughout my second career, but, I don't have uh, specific stories of the I was there in the manner in which, for example, um, North Macedonia became a NATO member. Perhaps someone else here uh, in the group might, might share their thoughts on that. What I have seen, and this 
response back to Stefan's comments is the political activism as well in creating interest within a home nation for NATO membership. And that can be done in conferences, in fairs, in public uh, uh, activities that have nothing to do with the politics or the governance of a nation. It's just where people are gathering together. And I saw that done uh, in a number of Eastern European states as they were seeking NATO membership. So it was an internal uh, growth of interest in NATO that was distributed among its publics, as well as this horse trading that I mentioned would be taking effect uh, between the member, uh, be, excuse me, between the nations seeking membership and the, and the NATO members themselves. Uh, my question is, uh, I would take my question as a position of a PhD in cultural studies, that uh, this is my second uh, PhD at the time I'm doing now. So uh, I'm among the present dangers from the an alliance, and uh, I saw that uh, you didn't mention the Russian infiltration. And I would, uh, 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 according to my knowledge and my research, I wouldn't uh, say that uh, the young generation, as you say, is the future of the alliance, especially not in our country, because they, they never lived in a, in a democratic society. They experienced the regime and the post-regime of uh, Nikola Gruevsky. And in, in, a very, in a lot of uh, countries in e Eastern Europe, unfortunately, this is the case. And uh, I will give you just uh, two examples about these infiltrations. For example, you said that NATO is a civil uh, organization, not a military, but the member of our Academy of Arts, uh, Ms. Katita Tulavkova, uh, she, says, she said that uh, NATO is uh, a military alliance and that, that we shouldn't be for that. And the second, the guy that is uh, responsible for all the employments in the administration, there, there are proofs that he is, has an uh, alliance with the Russia and the uh, State Department required from uh, our premier to uh, change this person because he's inadequate amongst 20 others, but our government didn't uh, change him. So I think that uh, this is the major, um, uh, issue uh, among the issues, as you said, of the uh, of the um, uh, this new kind of a cold uh, war, which is uh, through the social networks and the new technologies. So, uh, uh, do you think that uh, you you said that uh, soon we will uh, uh, will have some kind of restorement in the alliance? Do you have uh, do you think that uh, this restorement will, ta will tackle the question with these uh, infiltrations? Because I think they are very dangerous. Thank you. Well, uh, Igor, if I may, thank you for that, and uh, allow me to call you Dr. Troikov because I want you to uh, enjoy how that feels. That's a uh, I congratulate you on your studies, and particularly because it's in the the field of, of cultural, which of course in our age means cross-cultural and international. Uh, so I applaud you for that. First, as you and all of us understand, each of our nations, regardless of whether um, we look, uh, excuse me, each of our nations is dealing with every other country of the planet that is not in NATO as well. And certainly Russia is of concern to, uh, I should say, all of us, um, and certainly my nation and, and those of, of Eastern Europe in particular, those who border or have bordered or who have been working with, trading with, associated with Russia over, and the Soviet Union before that, over its, over its, lifetime. You have in the Republic of North Macedonia a fascinating history, and I was trying to get a sense of that as I was uh, studying for this presentation, uh, to, to just try to understand how you must feel, and you, you shared that 
I think very well, Igor, in, in what you've described um, and how this affects you and your fellow citizens today, but also the previous generations, your parents, your grandparents, your great grandparents, think the, the nations under which they have lived. Uh, my ancestors came from uh, Eastern Europe and as they, and, and you've heard this cliche, but my village stayed in the same location, but it changed ownership numerous times over the years. Of course, dealing with Russia, and by, by extension, I will say dealing with China as well, in this, technolo this age of new technologies, and the age, as you mentioned, of disinformation becoming very active in the manner in which it is shared and believed, uh, even worse, among our nation's citizens, is a challenge for each of us. Uh, there's no easy answer to this, as you know, but I suspect that, that as you achieve your doctorate and you complete and work uh, in this field, you'll be uh, writing more and more on this, on this uh, topic, and I look forward to reading it. So publish, please, in English as well. Thank you. So Larry, there is a question in the chat that said, looking in some countries in NATO that are becoming less democratic and more authoritarian, such as Hungary and Turkey, how did this development, how will this development affect the alliance? Ah, if I, uh, if I could read a crystal ball with the clarity that, that would answer that question, I'd be, uh, I'd probably be a more wealthy uh, individual than, than I am financially. Uh, today, and uh, certainly that's not me. I think one of the the issues I'm trying best to understand is how economically the COVID virus will affect the economies of our NATO nations, and what that will mean to the manner in which we deal in the alliance. Uh, so you have, you have an impact of disinformation, as Igor mentioned. You have the concerns of activism at home and growth that Stefan mentioned. You have the challenges of the virus and the manner in which each of our nations are having to deal and the impact uh, and the dissolution of much of our economic strengths in many of our countries. And now you have the manner in which uh, we're going to be dealing uh, and uh, within the alliance and what that will mean. Read again the last part of that question, Eric. Mute. Let me unmute here. Um, how will this development affect the alliance? And that's the development of of uh, none of, of more authoritarian, less democratic countries like uh, regimes. Uh, yes, got it. History would lead us to suggest that in a period of national crisis, it becomes easier to become more authoritarian versus more democratic. We've already seen in more than two nations, three nations, I, I can think of four nations perhaps, how just the manner of dealing with this virus has led the discussion as to whether elections will be postponed or whether they will be delayed uh, for how long and whether that will mean the continuation of a government that might otherwise not be in place following an election. That's a, that's a matter of concern to me personally. I don't know how that, that is perceived within the nations, as your uh, writer noted, 
uh, in Hungary or in Poland or in Turkey or in others. Uh, it remains to be seen. Each of us in our, I don't mean individually, but, but our capitals are watching how this plays out in the other capitals of the alliance. And certainly politicians who are looking to further their own concerns will learn from whatever they can find. Hello, Laura. I am Betty, a student of computer science, asking you a question. Um, I have seen that in China there have been massive protests in Hong Kong where uh, different human rights have been breached and there, there have been allegations of uh, torturing Uyghur Muslims and similar issues in China. Uh, I know that NATO has uh, initiated and taken before military actions for humanitarian reasons. Could something like that be expected to happen or is it, in, is it NATO's responsibility to uh, take care of humans all over the world. Batim, thank you. Two things come immediately to mind. First is the principle of consensus within the alliance, and I'll come back to that. Second is that when NATO has engaged uh, in other non-NATO countries of the world, it has been at the invitation of that country itself. In other words, uh, it was not a decision taken by NATO to intervene regardless of what was transpiring. It was a response at the request of either the nation itself through the United Nations or the nation itself direct to NATO. Frankly, I would expect that things in future would probably be uh, first raised within the United Nations, but that remains to be seen. Let me return to the consensus issue. Again, when NATO responds, if NATO responds, and, the, and if you will allow me, the NATO flag would be flown as a part of that response, that requires consensus on the part of the 30 nations now. So if a nation withholds their consensus, that NATO flag, that NATO military operation or civil operation would not take place. So consensus first has to be achieved, even regardless of whether any other part of the world has invited NATO to be present. There still must be that NATO consensus. And interestingly enough, providing political consensus on the part of the 30 nations does not imply anything other than that political consensus. In other words, and I'll use a sports metaphor here, everyone suits up, dresses for the game, but not everyone has to play. If you're providing your political consensus, you're suiting up to allow NATO's consensus to take place. But you do not have to, as a sovereign nation, participate. Conversely, your participation might be financial. Your participation might be with civil uh, authorities. It could be with fire, rescue, first responders. It could be with uh, uh, attorneys or parliamentarians. It could be with researchers, it could be with military. It just varies with how nations wish to respond. But team, you mentioned SSU. Is that the uh, university there in Tetovo? Uh, no, I said co computer science in Southeast European University in Tetovo, yes. Yes, excellent. I was, I was reading about that university uh, just the other day. It, it, has a, uh, it has a wonderful series of faculty across many different uh, disciplines, and I was, I was pleased to see it. As I remember, it's the third oldest 
in the country, but it, it seems to be growing very, very well. Um, good evening, if I may ask a question. Please, I can barely hear you, but um, I'll, uh, I'll boost my, uh, yeah. my audio here. Can you hear me better now? Uh, try it again. Can you hear me better now? Ah, yes, perfectly. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. So uh, my name is Kristina Angelevska uh, from Skopje. I'm a Community Solutions Program uh, Fellow alumni. So uh, I have a question regarding the cultural identities that you have mentioned at the very beginning of the presentation. Yes. Uh, since the country has recently progressed as the newest member state of NATO, what do you think, uh, specifically country specific to North Macedonia, what could be the um, connectors and dividers, uh, obstacles and enablers that uh, contribute to a uh, certain cultural division, uh, causing prejudices, stereotypes, regarding different social identities in the community arise from different social categorization and how do we manage to um, overcome this kind of um, uh, obstacles and help shape uh, our future thank you there's a lot to unpack in that christina and i don't know that i can do each of those uh points you raise justice but i will i will try to highlight a few of them and they really speak back to uh, the successes that I compliment you and your countrymen on already achieving. When I even noticed the language, um, the political and the, the legal language that speaks of co-official languages within the Republic of North Macedonia, I was very intrigued by that. As, as you can understand, uh, in the United States, our second most prevalent language is Spanish. And we don't even have an official language listed within the United States. Over the demographic change that we've seen in the United States and what we'll see in, in my children's successor generations, um, we could probably be experiencing what you have already worked through in the Republic of North Macedonia. And I congratulate you and your fellow citizens on this. You have taken a blending of cultures uh, from a variety of ethnic backgrounds and facilitated their living together as best you can today. And of course, that will change over time and over generations. But please, please don't, how best can I put this? Please appreciate what you have already done and how that appears to the rest of us who are looking from the outside into your culture and seeing the successes you've had. When I last walked in Sarajevo and worked, for example, with uh, individuals in, in, in and around Sarajevo, what I saw was, was how willing they were to work with each other, despite there being literally on opposite sides of military fighting uh, just uh, months earlier from when I was last there. And here in the Republic of North Macedonia, you have achieved so much without uh, a military conflict. You've, you've worked through this culturally, and that's no small achievement. So as I look to see what, what might support you in future, your generation and your successors, it, it really come, comes back to the first question that you're your, your North Macedonian colleague mentioned, to which I responded, activism. And it sounds like you, by virtue of your question, and Igor with his, and Batim, and the others, your interest in even this type of discussion today shows your engagement. And as you can broaden that, uh, 
through the means we've already discussed, you will see yourself becoming, yourselves becoming more successful. Uh, you can reach through the media, I think, so much more than my generation had been able to um, today. Thank you for that so very for this answer. question. Okay, do we have any final questions or final comments? Okay, so thank you for joining us here. Uh, it was a very informative, very good conversation, very good discussion. Thank you, Larry, for, for coming all the way from Virginia to talk to this group. I told you that they were well-educated. They would give you some difficult questions. I also told you how well they spoke English, which is always a pleasure to me. Uh, I could not imagine phasing some of the questions that they ask in a second language. And I am always, always impressed by the language, uh, the language ability. Uh, so thank you again. Do you want to say anything before we, before we leave? We'll unmute. Thank you. The questions, the comments that each of you have raised, as you well know, could fill uh, a series of discussions. And I would look forward to what you make of these in your own deliberations and your own studies and your own leadership. I'd like to be part of that in future, even digitally. So again, my thanks to you for joining me and I've learned from your comments and your questions. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, again, stay tuned for future events. We, now that we've figured out the technology of Zoom and the potential of Zoom, we will do these more often uh, on a variety of subjects. Next week, uh, the public affairs officer will do a, uh, a discussion on disinformation. He's had a lot of uh, experience dealing with, particularly with Russian disinformation, and will be uh, on uh, a chat sponsored by the American Corner and Steep. Uh, next Wednesday. So thank you all and have a good evening. <laughs>